talk more about towards the end of today's talk. I'm also now going to give a land acknowledgement. I gratefully acknowledge that we are on un the unceded ancestral homelands of the Mokama speaking Chimuquas. I recognize that other indigenous people also built homelands here, including the Yamases and Wales. For thousands of years, indigenous people made this region into a vibrant center of diplomacy, exchange, and religious practice. We pay respect to these nations and to their descendants. We further recognize the historical and ongoing impact of colonization in our region and state, as well as the resiliency of indigenous people. Today, Florida is home to the sovereign nations of the Seminole tribe of Florida and Miccosukee tribe of Indians of, of Florida, as well as citizens of other native nations and communities whose ancestors include Mokamas, Yamases, and Wales. And those are the three groups I'm gonna be talking about today. So I want to propose a new way of understanding the history of our region, at least through the early 18th century. One that views events through the lenses of the three different indigenous communities who made this space into their homelands. Collectively, the indigenous history of Northeast Florida is 97% indigenous. For far longer than the British, Spanish, or even the Americans, Northeastern Florida was Indian country. These lands were the rightful and sovereign lands of the people that we call Indians. The oldest Paleo-Indian or Clovis point to be found in our region is 13,000 years old. It was found on Ponte Beach, probably left here by Indians as they moved through the area. Around 6,000 years ago, the estuary stabilized and Indians began, began to construct more permanent year-round homes here. Archaeologists have discovered an early permanent settlement site at Spencer's Midden in Atlantic Beach, close to the Intracoastal Waterway. And indigenous people controlled and rightfully claimed ownership of Northeastern Florida until at least 1704, making 97% of our human history indigenous. Today my talk is gonna focus on three things. First, a chronological overview of the indigenous peoples whose homelands we are in today. Those are the Mokamas, the Yamases, and the Wales. And this part's going to feel a little bit like one of those Shakespeare, all the Shakespeare plays in an hour thing, where I'm <laughs> moving really fast through a lot of new material. So please, in this section and other sections, remember any questions that you have, and please bring them up at the end. I'm going to leave at least a half an hour for questions. And I ask this not only because I'm really interested um, in this talk, but also because this talk is part of a much larger and ongoing project where I'm reconstructing our local indigenous history. And really critically important to that is understanding what you're interested in. So I really welcome um, and am eager, I'm eager to hear your questions. So that's the first part. In the second part, I'm going to give you a little taste of what some of that new research looks like for this book project that I'm working on. And then I'm going to conclude by telling you where that work is going, where we are now with these new projects and where we are going. And I'm going to ask you for questions and ideas and things that we should be thinking about together. So I'm going to start by introducing you to who the Chimukwa were, and more specifically, who the Mokama were. Um, and you may have heard both of these words and wondered what they were about. Um, and this also helps to reinforce the notion that so much of our local indigenous history is, uh, so much of our local history is indigenous. Um, because if the statistic of time depth uh, didn't persuade you, maybe demography will. Scholars estimate that at contact, the Tumukwa population, just the Tumukwa speaking population of Florida, numbered between 200 and 300,000 people. And I'm not including the Appalachians, the Wales, the Calusas, the Ais, the Tequestas, the Tocobagos, or any of the other indigenous people of this region. It would take until the late 19th century for the state population to reach this level, the late 19th century. We often think of early American period as a period of population, but in fact it's a period of depopulation, through slavery, through disease, through uh, structural and overt violence. So what does Chimukwa mean? Chimukwa is a language family. It's not a polity, it's not a single political entity. And this outlines the contours of the Chimukwa language. And you can see within here all of the different dialects of Chimukwa, and in our region, our dialect is called Mokama, a little dash area. That represents the Mokama area within Chimukwa. And Mokama both stands for a dialect within Chimukwa and also is often used, and I will use it tonight, as a political term too, just to confuse all of you. 
So Tupacwa is not a political term, but Mokama is often used interchangeably as both a linguistic, uh, a linguistic and also a political term, and I'll get into that in just a little bit more. Okay. The French and Spanish populations in Northeast Florida in stark contrast to the Tupacwa and Mokama populations were both very small. Uh, Spanish St. Augustine at its height, with one exception, was usually around 1,500 people. Um, there's a brief period in the 1740s where there's a bit of population growth into the 2000s, but aside from that, it remains a fairly small community. The French, who are here very briefly, and I'll talk about um, in just a moment, numbered about 200 people. So demographically and chronologically, this is a very profoundly indigenous space that we're talking about. And in other ways, too. Archaeologists and historians have constructed the foodways, the home life of the French and Spanish, and particularly with the Spanish, they lived in what was largely day-to-day -day life, an indigenous world. They ate indigenous foods, they used indigenous house constructions, they relied on indigenous people's knowledge and communication networks in all sorts of ways. We tend to think of cultural change as unidirectional. We often look to see the ways in which indigenous people changed, but when we're talking about an overwhelmingly indigenous world in which a relatively small number of colonizers live, it's really critically important to also, th also think about how they were changed in turn through contact with the Mokamas. And we see that. Cultural change is not simply straightforward. It's not unidirectional. The Spanish profoundly lived in an indigenous world. Um, so here's a map that might be a little bit hard to see. It's quite beautiful. It's carefully reconstructed St. John's River. Um, around 1564. And so one of our, our brilliant textbooks at UNF actually took historic maps of the St. John's River and used them to speculate about what the river would have looked like and to reconstruct it. Um, and this is also online, and it's much easier to see there. And this is the southern part of Mokama. Mokama homelands reach much further north in the 1560s. But I want you to note a few things. Here's Dachariwa, here's a Torre, Here's the current Port Caroline Memorial. Port Caroline itself was probably somewhere more around here. Um, and what I want you to take away from that, and I'll explain more, is that we're really in the midst of a Mokama world. And this is something that we readily uh, acknowledge. In 1562, the French first came through our region for two days. Um, they spent their time mostly in Sacheriwa and Alamakani. And then they left, and they left a pillar um, that many have uh, interpreted as, as evidence of Spanish sovereignty, but that I reinterpret as evidence of, sorry, French sovereignty of a French gift. And this is certainly how the Mokamas interpreted it. And so today I'm going to talk just very briefly about how the Mokamas understood the French. And this is adding a new dimension to a story that we tend to tell only through the eyes of the French and the Spanish. In 1564, the French returned for less than two years. And they engage ultimately in an epic battle with the Spanish, which results in them leaving the region. And this is how the story is classically told, right? That the Spanish, feeling threatened in a territory that they have long claimed but have never really properly settled, um, battle with the French and oust them from the region. And I want to tell you that there's an important voice missing in that story, and it is this voice. It's the Mokama voice. It's the lands in whose in, uh, the people in whose lands all of this occurred. So in 1564, when the French first arrive, the Spanish are not here. The French once again go to the same region that they've been to before, um, and they begin to try to negotiate a treaty that will allow them to stay in this area. And ultimately, they're mostly negotiating with Satariwa, who appears to be the paramount chief, or Olada in Tumukwa, um, the paramount chief of all of this region. And ultimately, the, the Mokamas allow the French to stay, and they said they put them sort of somewhere around here, it's lands that aren't terribly good to settle. It's lands that they don't want. And this helps to also explain why the French don't do well, why they are starving, why they're completely reliant on the Mokamas for food. Um, and part of the treaty that they engage in with the Satariwas is that they will provide military assistance to the Mokamas if the Mokamas help to feed them. So they're essentially dependent on the Mokamas. And they offer the only thing that they have, which is military assistance. Because the French are not a true colony. They have a roughly 200 men who've come, predominantly soldiers, and some craftsmen who can build boats and forts and houses. There's one woman that we know of and no children. And they look like and are soldiers. And they live in a fortified settlement. And so their value to the Mokamas is that they are to aid them against their enemies. 
and they almost immediately don't do that. And they admit in their own writings that they're violating their treaty, that they are lying to the Mokamas, and that they are trying to ally with the very enemies that the Mokamas had hoped to have assistance with. And the reason they do that is because they believe those enemies have better access to gold and silver. And that's the main, the main reason. So over the course of many months, this relationship degrades. And by the time a French reinforcement comes, the day before the Spanish arrive, the French who've already been here say we can't possibly stay. There's absolutely no way for us to stay. We've completely destroyed our relationships with the Mohammed in the region. And in fact, they've already been making plans to leave. The French reinforcement reinforcements have been delayed, and so they've been thinking of going north because they can't possibly say their food resources have been cut off, they violated their treaty, the Mohammeds have stopped feeding them, and they are starving. Um, and this is what they say. So on the eve of that Spanish attack, even with French reinforcements coming in, the French know that they cannot stay in the region. So this adds to our story, right? This adds to our understanding of that epic battle between the French and the Spanish. <coughs> By providing Mokama perspectives, we can see a fuller sense of what was going on, not only in indigenous regions, but also among Europeans themselves. We've been missing this other voice. And so that's something that we've been working really hard to add in. And in fact, one of the students who's helped me do this work is here, is Emily. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about where that project is um, when we get towards the end. So the French leave in 1565, and it's the Mokamas who stay. It's the Mokamas who continue to control this space. Um, even as a small number of Spanish colonizers now move in to take possession of the French fort, even as a small number of Spanish missionaries who are also colonizers move in um, with a modest Spanish garrison, the Mokamas remain in control of their territory and they articulate this throughout the 16th and 17th centuries, that these are their homelands. The French actually acknowledge that from the beginning. There are these wonderful moments where the French say things like, we are settled in Sacheriwa's territory, and he comes to see our community almost every day to see what we're up to. Um, and that oversight is something that they acknowledge too. The Spanish try to make these territories into their own lands, and so there's a lot more discussion and a lot more effort by Tumukwas and Mokamas in particular to assert their ongoing sovereign rights to these territories. But it's not the Spanish at first, but the Yamasees who begin to move in large numbers into Mokama territory. So we have a small number of Spaniards, but a much larger number of Yamasees who begin to move in in the 1660s. And here's where we have our second group that I'm going to introduce you to tonight. So the Mokamas have been living here for a very long time, and now a new group comes in called the Yamasees. They are originally from interior Georgia. They move to the coast. In, this, in around 1661, near the mouth of the Savannah River initially, fleeing slave raids. And those slave raiders are being funded by Virginians who are purchasing enslaved Indians to use in Virginia and to ship abroad to the Caribbean. And this is part of a very big story of indigenous <coughs> enslavement across the Americas. Scholars estimate that roughly three to five million indigenous people were enslaved by the Spanish, the English, um, the French and others between the 16th and 19th centuries. In fact, in the United States, indigenous enslavement in some cases continued into the late 19th century, well beyond the abolition of African American slavery. And this is a story that is, is, there's a lot of good reading on that I can recommend, but it's still a little bit buried. Um, and so I'm not surprised if it's sort of the first time you're hearing about it, but it's certainly not original to me. What's original is my work on the Yamasees. So they move into the mouth of the Savannah River, fleeing Indians who are enslaving them and selling them to Virginia colonists. And they move again in 1663 into our region, fleeing those same slavers who have followed them down the mouth of the Savannah River and are now raiding their new communities or surviving communities there. And they begin to settle directly in our region, Amelia Island, St. Simons, and ultimately expand uh, onto Cumberland and Sapelo Islands. And this is Mokama space and it's also um, what's becoming Wale space, because the Wales are also moving south. So everyone's moving south at the same time. Um, and here I'm going to have to restrain myself and admit that this is what I've been doing for a decade. I've been writing about and looking at the Yamasees um, because they are quite, a more, quite an amazing community. They used mobility as a primary response 
to the shattering effects of European colonization, and between the 17th and 19th centuries, lived in all of these places across the South that I have been able to reconstruct, that I've been able to identify. And scholars have understood the Anasis very little because of this, because to put this kind of work together requires working across archives, it requires working through archeology, span and reconstructing a sense of what they're doing and where they're going when they're often trying to camouflage that to protect themselves. So the Yamasees move episodically, they move into our region, they actually move across Florida, and even as they move, they consider all of these spaces to be homelands, and they often return to them time and time again. So they're not by any means nomadic in this sort of stereotypical way that sometimes we're unfortunately taught as children about Native people. Rather, they move strategically, they move to places where they have connections already, they have vast communication networks, they move to places where they often have kin already, they have vast kinship networks. And what I hope you partly take away from this map is that those communication networks, those kinship networks are far superior in this period certainly to anything that the French or Spanish have in North America, right? Not in the Atlantic world, that's where they really shine. But in North America, this is Indian country. Um, the Europeans are really confined to the coast of what is a large and expansive and often interiorly um, oriented space. Okay, so I'm going to restrain myself because the book I've written is like this big and we'd be here for three days. But I'm always happy to talk more Yamasi. The last thing, the last thing I want to say about them before we move to the Wale is the Yamasi are really important in Florida to other indigenous communities because they do a number of things. They reject Franciscan missionization outright especially in our region, while they will come. In Appalachia, there's a small Tama Yamasee community that experiments with missionization and finds it really disastrous. In our region, they outright reject it. And other indigenous people watch them do this. They also reject Spanish efforts to interfere in their political governance. There are moments where the Spanish, both Franciscans and Spanish officials, try to meddle with internal domestic affairs among this sovereign nation, and they say no. Absolutely not. You have no right to determine who our citizens are. You have no right to determine who our uh, Mikos or chiefs are. That's all our business. And so even as they settle into regions where there are other indigenous polities and also Europeans, especially the Spanish, the Yamasees maintain a sense of sovereignty, and that is what they protect above all. And other indigenous communities witness them doing this. And they are a strong counter to Spanish colonization. Um, and we'll see that that's really important, especially for the Wales. So the third group that I'm going to talk about today who live in our region are the Wales. And the Wales, as we've seen in sort of earlier maps, if you were noticing, and I know it's tiny and I tried to blow it up as big as I could, but they are, in fact, uh, indigenous to coastal Georgia. They begin to move south or sort of live a little bit above the Savannah River all the way to the Altamaha. They begin to move south in the 14th century. And then they settle north of the, of the Mokamas, and there's a borderland between them where nobody settles. And what this tells us, all of this is pre-contact, what this tells us is they are not allies because you don't need a nice empty buffer borderland if you are if you are kin or trading regularly um, or allied with them. So there's a long period where there seems to be kind of a mutual decision that there's animosity and they're going to have this borderland between them. And that all begins to change around 1600. This is when Spanish missionization is really getting going, not only in but also Wale, also in parts of Western Tumukwa too. And a fascinating thing happens in many different regions, but especially ours, which is that indigenous people respond to Spanish missionization by creating new interaction networks. And we know this through their pottery. This is again where archeology span becomes really important to me as a historian. So we see vast changes in their archeology, span uh, in their pottery, especially in what the Mokamas are producing. They radically changed their pottery to match that of the Wales. They've had completely different pottery systems, and now suddenly they're very similar, so, so similar. And what this tells us is that female potters, because these communities are run in a lot of ways by women, and certainly their ceramic traditions are run by women, um, they're the potters. Female potters are sitting with each other and talking to each other across what is a linguistic and deep history divide. Um, because the, the Mokamas and Wale speak completely different languages. The Mokamas speak Tumukwa, as we've seen. The Wale speak a Muscogean language. They've had that buffer zone, and that goes away. They begin to interact. 
It's a response to colonization. They create a new indigenous network that some scholars have um, argued is a religious revitalization movement of their own because they're pressing into those clay pots images that represent their world. And so even as they're being introduced to Catholicism, they're also rejuvenating their own religion. So they begin to move even closer um, in around 1684. They've suffered through, most recently in 1680, a major slave attack. Uh, 1683, major series of pirate attacks. 1684, another series of pirate attacks. And they move largely onto Amelia Island. That's where all the Wales who are interested in staying in Florida move. And I say interested in staying in Florida because that's really important. Everything that I'm showing you today, I only know through European colonial archives or archeology. span And all of our archeology span at the moment is based on what documents tell us for this period. There are so many moments where the Spanish have no idea what indigenous people are doing. The number of times they describe Indians going into the woods feels like a musical. I mean, they're constantly in the woods. And the woods just literally means anywhere that the Spanish don't know. Right? It all seems like woods to them. They know coastal areas. They know areas along the Camino Real. They know certain towns and nothing else beyond that. Um, and for information about beyond, they have to rely on indigenous informants who tell them snippets of what they want the Spanish to know. And that's it. So there are Wales living beyond these territories. There are Mohammeds living beyond these territories. There are Yamases, absolutely. We, can, we saw that map living well beyond the reach of the Spanish. Um, and so what I can do is reconstruct and begin to try to understand what the woods mean and what might be going on beyond there and to tell you that there is a beyond, beyond there, and that that's important to remember. So if they begin to move into a region um, really earlier, but 1684, we see them on Amelia Island. And they have, in fact, occupied what have been Yamasee towns there because the Yamasees have left. In 1683, they leave. And remember, I said they're a very powerful counter to Spanish colonization. When they leave, hundreds of Wales go with the Yamasees and become citizens of the Yamasee nation. They move up into what we think of as South Carolina, and then they move, as we saw on that map, a number of more times that are beyond the scope of kind of today's talk. So those who want to stay do. Those who do, don't, don't. And those who stay still sometimes leave. There are further and further additional Wales who continue to go to Yamasee into the early 18th century, as late as 1702, um, when there's a massive strike uh, led by the English and the Yamasees on Amelia Island and on St. Augustine that results, the Spanish say, in the complete demise of indigenous communities in our region. But again, they don't know what's happening in the woods. And neither do, do we yet, which I hope we do one day. Okay. So this gives you a sense, um, and this is not my map, all the other maps today, uh, today are my maps, but this one, and I don't like that it's in Spanish for it. But it's a great map otherwise. Um, but all of this shows you sort of some of the movements we're talking about, right? That there's a great period of upheaval. But hold on to that idea that I've said even as indigenous people move, they create new homelands. So these are not uprooted people who don't have a sense of space or territory, quite the reverse, because they move. They have a profound sense of how to make places out of space. Uh, and so they do that really in, in a number of ways, through religion, through constructions, through political uh, meaning. Uh, they make all of these spaces into their homeland. Okay, so that was the kind of big overview um, of the three different indigenous communities whose homelands we're on. And now I'm gonna provide you just with a little bit of what I'm doing right now. Um, this is new research and so, um, it's fascinating, and it's at the stage where I'm just putting stories back together. And one of the things I'm really beginning to focus on for this new book project that I hope to really turn to next summer once the Yamasee book, which is under contract, is kind of on, off and on its way, copy edited and all that, is um, powerful Mokama women. Um, it's really hard to find Yamasee women. So this is the prior project that I'm finishing up. Really hard to find them. Um, and that's why I turned to archaeology because those are women's worlds. And remember, they're the main potters in their community, and that's a lot of what archaeologists do. Not entirely. I'm assured that they do many other things, but pot shirts seem to be a really big part of their world. But when I turned to Mokama, I didn't have to look so hard. It was refreshing. It was really, really refreshing. So the first thing to know is that all of the communities I've been talking about are matrilineal. And that means that women are the heads of their households. They own everything in their house. 
Their children trace their descent from their mothers, not their fathers. So they take clan membership from their mothers, not their fathers. Their fathers are often not their primary role models when it comes to men. Those are usually their mother's brothers, their uncles. And that is the source of identity. These women govern their households. They also often have a lot of political sway. And that's true of all the communities I've been looking at, but really pronounced among the Mokama. And I'm so pleasantly surprised to, dis to discover this. So between 1564 and 1717, at least 19 of the caciques, or chiefs, of the Mokamas were women. Um, they were what the Spanish called caciques, female chiefs. This is unusual to see in Spanish records, um, but it's also part of what's happening across Tumuqua. So across the rest of Tumuqua, not including Mokama, which was that big part, and Mokama is that small part, about another 21 female chiefs are identifiable. So Mokama, there is something special going on. Even as within Tumuqua, there are a lot of women who serve as chiefs during the, during the so-called colonial period. It's even more pronounced in Mokama. And you can't imagine how this delighted me after 10 years of searching for Yamasi women. So I'm going to talk about a few of the stories that I've been able to reconstruct. Oh, and they're both matrilineal and matrilocal, which means that husbands move into their wives' towns and their wives' homes, and they're guests in those homes, and they can leave. And those homes stay the same, whether they're there or not. They have a role to play, but not a strong one the way we construct sort of in our patrilineal society today, which is largely still patrilineal. Um, and so this really is a very differently organized society. So I'm going to talk about a few stories um, of powerful women who are very easy to find in the Spanish records, which is wonderful. Despite the Spaniards' best efforts to hide them, they couldn't because they were out there governing the communities that the Spanish wanted access to. So the first is Casica Doña Aña. So they call her Adan or Doña. Uh, in 1600, we believe, she began to serve as the paramount the entire Mokama province. She is the head chief. She is the chief of chiefs. She inherits her position from her uncle Juan and directly governs at least 14 other chiefs who are under her and are mostly men. At a large meeting attended by Casica Anya's subordinate caciques or chiefs, the Spanish governor in 1603 found himself in the position of having to buttress her authority and admonish the assembled diplomats, who were largely men, to quote, obey in all things the orders given them by their head and chieftainess Doña Anya. He was very uncomfortable with this, but he did it nonetheless. Because in truth, the alliance between the Mokamas and Spanish was on shaky ground. Conso, or this is the governor, Governor Conso's reason for traveling to Mokama was in large part because the Franciscan church located where Casica Anya governed, and this is how the Franciscans operated, they put their main church, if they possibly can, in the Paramount's town, hoping to convert people more easily that way. Well, that church is literally falling down by 1603. It's in tatters, which shows you how effective they've been so far. So Anya agrees to join with the Spanish governor to repair this tattered symbol of the Spanish presence in Mokama, but she at the same time asserts her sovereign claims to the territory on which it sits. Very cleverly, right? And as part of their tentative alliance, she leverages the Spanish to reinforce and maybe even augment her regional power. Um, for instance, the chief of a nearby town was contemplating moving his people to a different town. People move, especially in the woods. Um, and was conspicuously absent from the, the meeting, saying that he didn't feel well. Sick note. In response, the Spanish governor sent word to him that he didn't need permission from the Spanish to move. He needed permission from Doña Anya to move, because she was the one who made those sorts of decisions. He claimed to the Spanish governor later that he had to reinforce Doña Anya's power because, quote, she was a woman. At one point, he even referred to her as a girl, and he, she needed to be rescued, and her subchiefs didn't respect her. But Doña Anya was part of a matrilineal dynasty that included two sisters who governed the rest of the, the towns under Mokama. Her sister, Doña Inez, had her seat of power at San Juan del Puerto at Alamacani, and Doña Maria's seat of power was at Nombre de Dios, just outside of St. Augustine. These were three powerful sisters who governed all of Mokama together. This was no girl who needed Spanish rescuing. Mm -hmm. So through this matrilineal dynasty, they controlled Mokama. And like her sister, Doña Inez, leveraged the Spanish to expand her own power 
The chief of a different town, she reported, did not obey her as was right, and another chief similarly refused to obey her orders and had relocated, guess where, into interior country to the pine woods. <laughs> the woods are everywhere. And so Conso, not only this governor, issued verbal commands undergirding Doña Inez's power, but also dispatched a search party to retrieve the Mocama runaways for her. So here are powerful Mocama women working that Spanish governor and getting him to do their labor for him, for them, getting him to really assert his authority under her, right? Which is the inverse of what we normally talk about with the Spanish. <clears throat> As another example, in the 1620s, and this is very shadowy, the documents are really fractured, two unnamed caciques of at least two Mocama polities assumed leadership roles in a broader anti-Spanish movement underway. And again, this is something we don't tend to talk about in Mocama. The current narrative about colonization in Mocama is that everything went smoothly. It was all good. They just all converted. The Franciscans tell us this repeatedly. Everything's good in Mokama. Yeah, we had that big revolt in Wale in 1597. Everything's good in Mokama. Yeah, we had a big revolt in Tumuqua and in Apalachee at the mid 17th century. Everything's good in Mokama. It's not. They're just not telling anyone that. So these fractured documents talk about this revolt in Mokama. So these two caciques assume this leadership role at least by, um, this revolt is underway at least by 1622 when Indians begin to leave. San Pedro, or Pangolin Island, as well as Wale to the north. Um, and when the Spanish arrest the chief of Santa Maria, his sister, the cacica of San Juan del Puerto, launches a military rescue mission to retrieve her brother. She was hanged by the Spanish governor, and five of uh, her young male relatives were sentenced to have their ears cut off in permanent exile in Havana. Another female cacica was arrested at the same time because she now rejected the Spanish and wanted to be completely free of them. What became of her is unclear, but the entire region of Mokama soon joined in cutting the Spanish off and symbolized this by removing all of the canoes from key travel points along the coast to prevent the Spanish from accessing their communities. Into the 1650s through 1680s, the Mokamas continued to experience increased population loss largely throughout migration to the woods and, and other places but also disease, declining health, missionization, the River Niancho labor system, um, and also slave raids. And Mokama women continued to navigate their communities through the shattering violence of colonization. So just check the time, I don't know. Um, and so this is the last Mokama example I'm gonna offer. And this is a really powerful one for me. In 1681, the head chief of the entire Mokama province in Northeast Florida was once again a woman named Casica Meranciana and she defended her community's territory against threats by two different polities. The Yamasees had recently taken up residence on Cumberland Island, on Amelia Island as well. And these were islands that the Mokamas had lived on but moved off of, but that she continued to claim as part of her community's territory. She also defended her community against the Spanish, who had long tried to incorporate Mokama lands and Mokama people into their fragile Florida outposts through missionization, through a labor system, through geopolitical colonization. Now, Marinciana had inherited her paramount seat in 1678 from her aunt, Juana Melendez, who decided to retire, as we all should, after serving as the Mokama paramount from 1665 to 1678. She had served her term. She had inherited her title from her uncle, Clemente Bernal. So, Marinciana takes up the paramount seat in 1678, and she watches as Yamasees move onto her lands and she says to the Spanish and to the Yamasees, you owe me tribute. I want a portion of the deer fat. I want a portion of the berries that you collect. I want a portion of the deer hides and the, be the bears that you hunt. Um, and she says this is her right as the sovereign of this territory. And she writes the Spanish letter in 1681 to contest what's happening. And the Spanish governor returns the letter to her, returns rightfully his own letter to her and says, really these are the king's lands and anyone may hunt on them or gather berries um, or anything else that they find there. And she says, oh, these are not the king's lands. These are my lands by right of inheritance. These are my people's lands. This is my territory. And again, this is a counter to the narrative we often hear of the Spanish progressively colonizing, progressively missionizing and converting indigenous people. There are some converts 
there is certainly a Spanish presence. There is certainly Spanish damage through especially the labor system. But Marinciana continues into the 1680s and beyond to assert her communities, her nations, right to that territory. And she does it verbally and she does it in written format too. So this has been fun. This is very fun work. Okay, so I want you to have a few takeaways from today and then I'm going to talk about some of the projects that I'm working on. So some of the takeaways are that the Spanish had essentially, at their height, two modest hubs in a much larger indigenous world. And those two hubs were St. Augustine, and then also uh, there's a Spanish hub in Appalachia, especially by the 1650s into 1703. And that's where they have their lieutenant governor, and they consider that their second seat of government. But it's right in the center of Appalachia, and they have a large garrison and also some Spanish settlers there too. But these two hubs are really hubs in a much larger indigenous world, a much older indigenous world um, that has been entangled for a very long time, that has complex communication networks and kinship networks that span well beyond Florida. Um, and so I want that to be a takeaway. Like all societies, the Mokama, Wale, and Yamasee changed over time. And this is a narrative that we sometimes see in some museums, the idea that the Tumukwas had not changed before European colonization, and they surely did. That's part of what our project attempts to do, is to recover deep time and understand how, how indigenous people, like all people, change over time. And the French and Spanish change over time. And one of my big hopes is that we begin to think about cultural and political change as bi-directional, or multi-directional, not unidirectional indigenous people, not as vessels of cultural change, and Spanish and French and others as agents of change, but to think really in sophisticated ways about how interactions changed everyone involved. Um, and that indigenous women, especially Mokama women, retained political and social power in their communities in fascinating ways that have only just begun to recover. So I've got a number of these projects I'm working on, not alone by any means. I couldn't do all this work by myself. The Yamasee book has almost killed me, and I did that all alone. <laughs> so now I'm working, working with people, which is much more wonderful. Um, I just had a special issue of the Florida Historical Quarterly that I co-edited with Andrew Frank come out, and Andrew Frank works at FSU. He's a historian of the Seminoles. I highly encourage you to read it if anything sounded interesting today. We've got an introduction that we co-wrote, and then there are great pieces on like the Appalachie by other folks. Appalachie, the Creeks, um, and even Vero Beach in the 20th century. Um, and so that's been a really fun uh, several year long project that's starting to come to fruition. I'm starting to co-write with Dr. Keith Ashley, who's an archeologist at the University of North Florida, a new public facing book called Hepa Utanile, which means our land in Tumukwa an indigenous history of Northeast Florida, and it's inspired directly by the exhibit that is here. So in 2019, we began to work on an exhibit in partnership with the Beaches Museum that you can go see if you haven't already. Um, Keith and I taught a class, he's a wonderful UNF student, and we produced together our first museum exhibit for all of us just about, which is a wonderful learning experience. It was supposed to launch in March of 2020, but something else happened instead. And so it got delayed a bit, but it's been up for a while now. Um, and it's just a wonderful resource, I hope, for all of you. Um, we've also moved into some digital humanities, which I'll talk about in a moment. But that book, that, that one exhibit convinced us we could write a whole book about this and that we needed it. And we needed it to be short, not big, like my Yamasee book, but nice and short, um, and to be very public accessible. So it's our effort to really bring our scholarship to everyone. And so that's part of why I really welcome your questions and thoughts today. Um, I've also joined the Tumukwa language group. So there's a linguist at the University of Florida named Erin Broadwell who has completely reconstructed the Tumukwa language. This is a miraculous piece of work that he's done. Um, so the Tumukwa language has the second largest corpus of indigenous language materials for the colonial period in the present day United States second only to the Massachusetts language, and it has never been translated. It's been sitting there since the early 17th century waiting for someone to look at it. And he's the first linguist to do it, and we're, I'm so grateful it was him. He is brilliant. And he's created the whole corpus, he's translated the whole corpus. Um, he has developed a grammar, which is coming out. It's under, public, it's under uh, contract right now. Um, I think it just went out for review. He's also developed a dictionary online, so I didn't put that here, but if you put in Tumukwa Webinary, you would get the dictionary pop up. And with Alejandro Dukovsky, who's a wonderful historian of indigenous Florida, 
they started a group to get together and to really begin to make meaning of the corpus and most importantly to create a website where you can learn to mukwa, where anybody can learn to mukwa, and that's what this is, the Hebwano WordPress site. You can go and every two weeks we meet and I quietly sit and listen to their brilliance and don't do much and try to, I get excited when I recognize a word um, and say I don't understand that a lot. Uh, and um, it's wonderful. They're just doing great work. So I highly encourage if you're interested in language to take a look at that. And one of the most skilled linguists in the group is a high school math teacher in Jacksonville. And he's tremendously brilliant and it's just wonderful to listen to that. And then the last project is a digital humanities project which Emily has helped me a lot with. And we started this in a class, Keith and I. We knew nothing about digital humanities. This is how we learn. We just decide, I push him to, to bravely decide to do stuff with me, I'm crazy, and so he says yes. And um, we have wanted it to come out in the summer, but it's not quite there. So we uh, taught a course, we started to develop a digital humanity site, I got some mentorship, which is really helpful. And the first project we're almost done with, which is an indigenous tour of Fort Caroline. And you will be able to go to Fort Caroline, which is a national park which memorializes the French as it must by Congressional Act. That is its charge. That act was created in the 1950s. And you can pull up on your phone and read the Mokamba story. So you can get the French story there and you can also get the Mokamba story at the same time. And we're just kind of putting the finishing touches on it and I hope that we release it in the spring. That's going to be the first component. There are many other components that will be coming. And all of this is to make the work that we're doing you know, available to everyone. This isn't just for us. Um, we are academics who are decisively moving into public spaces and really want to be there. So I welcome questions or thoughts. I tend to not want to drone on too long. So I'm hoping 50 minutes was not too long, but you're very patient. So yes, go ahead. Where did the French go when they left here? We moved here from Copenhagen, Maine. Okay. Which is named for the Baron de Saint Did not go to Maine. They went back to France. Yeah, that was, and Long Haul, no, it would have taken a long time because this is 1565. 1565. They go back to France. Yes, you're talking about a different French colonial venture. Yes, but welcome from Maine. but there's certainly trade that predates colonization between Native people in South Florida and the Caribbean, which is not my specialty, but absolutely. I know our family. they got any warnings when the Spanish arrived from the Caribbean? Oh, advanced warnings from those communication networks? I mean, they get advanced warnings. So the Yamasees, for example, are in interior Georgia, and they definitely know when, this, like when Hernando de Soto comes through, they know he's coming, and they very cleverly kind of maneuver him in and out of their region. Um, so there are communication networks, but I don't know, you know if they reach directly to the Caribbean, but certainly from South Florida, absolutely. And in this period, the Calusas communicate increasingly with like the Apalachees and Tumquas. Um, so for example, the Calusas know when Yamasees become slave raiders for a period, and the Calusas begin to know about Yamasees slaving in their region through their networks to the Apalachees and Tumquas. But I don't know as much about the Caribbean. There's some great archaeology. St. Catherine's Island, Yes. does that fall within the area you were looking at? And yes. many of these indigenous people come from there? Yes, St. Yes. Yes. Catherine's Island is Wale, and Wale. that's like considered uh, the head of the Wale province for a long period. The Spanish put their main church there. Right. They have their garrison there. The Yamasees also consider St. Catherine's Island to be their territory, too. It's really interesting in the 1680s when they move into what we think of as South Carolina, present day South Carolina, um, the Spanish are both eager to have the Yamasees come back to Florida because they're such um, a powerful force and also very concerned about Yamasees taking over St. Catherine's Island because they, it's by this point no longer inhabited by the Spanish or the Wallis that we know of. Um, and they repeatedly talk about the Yamasees around St. Catherine's Island and say that this is a threat. And in fact, the Yamasees when the, the Spanish sent a, sent a spy to South Carolina to meet with the Yamasees, it's a friar 
Um, and the Amish we say, we'll come and meet you on St. Catherine's Island when we come to, uh, to harvest our figs. And they claim the land that way. These are our figs, our crops. Um, and everyone sort of doesn't bat an eye uh, because they're claiming that space. So yes, so there might be. I actually just saw um, one of the archeologists at SEAC last week, and he was saying they have a site he wonders if it could be on the sea. But he doesn't know this. It's very early, very, very early. He said it looks different from the Wale site. So, and I've been emailing them for years saying, anything about the Amasee site? Mm -hmm. And he came up to me and he said, your talk reminded me, maybe. Yes? What group was around Dania? Around? Dania. Dania. Where's Dania? That's uh, just north of Hollywood. South of okay. Lauderdale. and they're hard to see in archives 
but when I can see them, people mostly make decisions that are life-changing based on their matrilineal networks, which can be very expansive again and have often little to do with where they live or the nation that they're part of. So there's that too. Yes, go ahead. Where are these people today? Where are they? That's a really good question. So one of the problems in our region, right, is the terminal narrative. We often go into different museum sites, not here, different <laughs> museums, and they just either disappear from the narrative or we're told that they're extinct, which is, I call it a paleontological term, right? It's dinosaurs go extinct. We shouldn't talk about indigenous people that way. So for a long time, scholars believed that all of these people just died or there's the narrative that they all, the, the last few left with the Spanish, and that's simply not true. Um, we know that they move, right? Not just to the woods, but they move other places. And especially after 1702, it's really more after 1704, but after 1702 when there's that big um, assault by the British and the Yamasees, they move elsewhere. Um, and so there are some fractured documents that show, for example, Mokamas going and settling among the lower creeks on the Chattahoochee River. Um, there are definitely Yamasees and Wales and and Mokamas, who are claimed as ancestors by the Seminole Tribe of Florida and the Muscogee Creek Nation of Oklahoma. Today, they claim them as ancestors. Um, and so that's, that's some of where they go, but they go other places. They're, and they probably continue to, to know and to understand, again, all of their multilateral identities, right? Who they are, where they come from. But it's hard to see in the European archival documents. So my favorite is a map from the early 19th century of the people who will in the 20th century call themselves Seminoles, but they're not Seminoles yet, but the British are already calling them Seminoles. And the map says like, here are some towns, and here are some towns in Florida, here are some other towns, and then there's a bunch of other towns that I didn't write down. <laughs> and you're like, fantastic, thank you so much. <laughs> so you just get a sense that they know something, but they don't clearly know everything. Um, and, and there's just a limit to what you can find through just those documents. So you have to read from so many different archives and archeology, span and then partnering with indigenous communities today, with indigenous nations, is really critically important. They know a lot of things we don't know. Um, so just you know, meeting with the Seminoles and the Muscogees and hearing about these are their ancestors, that's really powerful. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, go ahead. One quick easy question. How is that an easy question? <laughs> what was their lifespan? I don't know. I mean, I think it depended, right? So we know that, um, I didn't talk about a lot about the Repartiento, but one of the most damaging aspects of Spanish colonization for the Mocamas, Wales, other Tumquas, and Appalachians um, is the Repartiento labor system, which the Spanish force on them in different moments. So for example, after the Wales after the lead a massive war in 1597 to oust the Spanish, um, the price of peace is a number of things, including that they provide laborers for the repartimiento system. And so they have to give every year, the, the caciques and caciques have to decide which young men are gonna go live in St. Augustine, which can be certain death for like four months of the year. Um, they also run like all the ferries, they also provide um, Sabanas, which are fields that are grown to support the Franciscans. Um, and this is really damaging. And so bioarchaeologists have shown that this really devastates their bodies and really affects, I guess, their lifespan. But I haven't, it's probably in there, I just haven't focused on the life. The, the, other, the other side, you touched on it briefly, but the literacy piece, you talk about the letter. Oh, yeah, literacy is really so interesting. interesting. Could they read or write? That's a great question. extramarital sex. 
And the two have very different constructions of that, and they come across very differently. And so what you see are Tumukwa scholars sort of taking Catholic ideas and trying to put them in a, into a Tumukwa world view and translating those. The Franciscans at some point say things like the Tumukwas became literate in six months. So what does that tell us? It probably wasn't six months, and they're trying to get funding. Um, but it also tells us they learned it so quickly because they already had the the building blocks of literacy. And we know that they communicated in all sorts of different ways. They used sign language before contact. They drew in the sand. Um, there are all sorts of different ways in which they commemorated things where they you know, didn't use verbal communication. So they are literate before Europeans arrive, and that's why they can adopt European literacy so quickly. And we have to also, I think, expand what we define as literacy, and that's been one of the fun things to think about through this. So yes, absolutely, they're, they're writing. And in fact, there are letters that survive written by Tumukwas and Appalachians, a few um, themselves. There's one from the 1650s that Alejandro Dukovsky and Aaron Broadwell have worked on, which again asserts, this is my land. It's from Western Tumukwa. This is my land, and the governor's son has taken it, and we need it back, because this is ours. Um, so there's some really great, great documents out there in written by indigenous people. Not a lot, but some. Anybody else? Any questions? It got warmer up here. <laughs> <laughs>